In this video, we're going to discuss protic solvents and aprotic solvents. So what exactly is a protic solvent? Protic solvents tend to have hydrogen bonds in them. Good examples are water, methanol, and ethanol. These are the most common examples that you'll see when dealing with SN1 and SN2 reactions. And so what you need to know is that protic solvents they favor the SN1 reaction. Now, aprotic solvents, polar aprotic solvents, they favor the SN2 reaction. And some examples of a polar aprotic solvent would be acetyl nitrile. As you can see, there are no OH or NH groups. Another example is acetone or dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO. Another example is a crown ether. So these are some examples of polar aprotic solvents. And they work very well for SN2 reactions. Now let's begin our discussion with the SN1 reaction. So let's say if we have tert butyl bromide. The first thing that has to happen in the SN1 reaction is that the leaving group has to leave. The carbon-bromine bond has to break. And anytime you break a bond, you need to put in energy to do it. It's an endothermic process. Whereas to form a bond, it's an exothermic process. You need to energy is released anytime a bond is formed. So the ionization in the first step of an S1 reaction is endothermic. That energy has to come somewhere. And so the solvent, it helps in breaking this bond. It helps to ionize this alkyl halide. So let's say this is the carbon atom, and here we have the bromine atom. Bromine has a partial negative charge. It's more electronegative than carbon. Carbon has a partial positive charge. And so let's use water as a solvent. The hydrogen atoms of water are attracted to the bromine atoms because the hydrogen atoms has a partial positive charge. And so bromine feels an electrostatic force that pulls it towards the water molecules, towards the hydrogen atoms of the water molecules. Now oxygen has a negative partial charge, and so the partially positive carbon atom is attracted to it. And so oxygen can pull the carbon atom in the opposite direction. And thus water can basically pull apart the carbon from the bromine atom, thus facilitating ionization. And so a polar protic solvent can help to ionize an alkyl halide into a carbo cation and a halide ion. Not only can water facilitate the ionization of an alkyl halide, but it can also stabilize the ions that are formed as well. So once we get a carbo cation, the oxygen atoms of water can basically solvate or stabilize the carbo cation. Now, we said that it requires energy to break a bond, in this case, to break the carbon-bromine bond. And so that's the endothermic process. We've got to put in energy to break that bond. At the same time, notice that we're forming these ion dipoles, these interactions. And so anytime you form a bond, energy is released. And the, and the formation of these ion dipoles releases energy. And that provides the energy to break this carbon bromine bond. Now, in the case of the bromide ion, it's solvated by the hydrogen atoms in water. The hydrogen atoms has a partial positive charge, and so they're going to be attracted 
to the bromide ion. So water is able to solvate these ions. And so all of this facilitates ionization. And not only that, but water can also stabilize the transition state between the carbon bromine bond as it turns or becomes an ion. So the transition state should look something like this. Here are the three methyl groups of tert butyl bromide. And we're breaking away the carbon bromine bond. So here's the bromine atom. So as that happens, bromine acquires a negative charge. So right now it's partially negative. And carbon is about to acquire a positive charge. So in the transition state, it has a partial positive charge. And the oxygen will help stabilize that increase in partial positive charge. And the hydrogen atoms of the bromine, I mean of water, can help stabilize the increase in negative charge that's forming on the bromine atom. And so water can not only stabilize the ionic species that form from this ionization process, but it can also stabilize the transition state. And by stabilizing the transition state, it lowers the activation energy, thus increasing the rate of the reaction. And so if you were to draw an energy diagram, let's say this was the original energy profile. Here is the transition state. And if you could stabilize the transition state, you lower its activation energy. And so less energy is required to get the reaction started. This is the new activation energy compared to the old or original activation energy. And so anytime you could stabilize the transition state of a reaction, then you could increase the rate of the reaction. And so that's how the SN1 reaction works better in a polar protic solvent. The polar protic solvent, like water or methanol, can stabilize the carbocation intermediate and the bromide ion that forms, and it could also stabilize the transition state. Now, what about polar aprotic solvents? How do these solvents enhance the SN2 reaction? Now, it's important to understand that the rate of an SN2 reaction depends on the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the nucleophile. And what a polar aprotic solvent does is it enhances the strength of the nucleophile. Whereas in a protic environment, the strength of the nucleophile weakens. So let's use fluoride. Let's say if we're reacting an alkyl halide with potassium fluoride. Fluoride is a good nucleophile using a polar aprotic solvent, but it's not a good nucleophile in a protic environment. If you put fluoride in water, water is going to surround the fluoride molecules. And so water will solvate this nucleophile. As a result, this nucleophile, you could think of it as being in prison. It's trapped by the water molecules, and so it's not free to react. In order to make it react with an alkyl halide, you need to break these strong ion dipole interactions. And so a protic solvent, it basically weakens the strength of the nucleophile. And if you weaken the strength of the nucleophile, the rate of the reaction will go down. And so that's why Protic solvents like water and methanol, they're not good for SN2 reactions because they solvate the nucleophile, thus decreasing the rate of the SN2 reaction. Now, an aprotic solvent does not solvate a nucleophile. It doesn't solvate the anion. And that's why polar aprotic solvents are very good for the SN2 reaction. Now, let's use acetone as an example. Acetone is a polar aprotic solvent. 
Now, you cannot use a nonpolar solvent for these reactions because potassium fluoride is an ionic compound, and ionic compounds do not dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So you have to use a polar solvent, either a polar protic solvent or a polar aprotic solvent. And acetone is a polar aprotic solvent. The oxygen atoms in acetone bear a partial negative charge. And so as a result, they are attracted to the positively charged potassium cation. So notice that the polar aprotic solvent, it solvates the cation, but not the fluoride anion. And so as a result, fluoride is no longer held by this cation. And so fluoride is free to react with an alkyl halide. So the polar aprotic solvent is good for the SN2 reaction because it doesn't solvate the anion. It doesn't solvate the nucleophile. And as a result, the nucleophile is more reactive. And if you can increase the strength of the nucleophile, you can increase the rate of an SN2 reaction. Another good example of a polar aprotic solvent is the crown ether. And so this is the 18 crown 6 ether, or 18 6 crown ether. As you can see, there are six oxygen atoms and a total of 18 carbons. And this is very good for solvating the potassium ion, allowing the fluoride ion to be free to react with the alkyl halide. So to review, aprotic solvents like acetone, a crown ether, and things like that, they work well for an SN2 reaction because they only solvate cations. They do not solvate anions, and anions are nucleophiles. So as a result, the nucleophile is free to react. So if you can increase the strength of the nucleophile, the rate of the SN2 reaction goes up. And so aprotic solvents are good for SN2 reactions. Now, protic solvents, they're good for the SN1 reaction. And the reason for that is they can stabilize the transition state. They make it more stable. And they can also stabilize the carbocation that's formed as a result. The water molecules can solvate the carbocation intermediate, making it more stable. Now, the SN1 reaction, the rate, depends only on a substrate and not on a nucleophile. So when you use a protic solvent, the strength of the nucleophile decreases. So let's use fluoride. Well, I'm just going to use a generic nucleophile term. So whenever you use a protic solvent, the water molecules, they can solvate the nucleophile, thus making it less reactive. And so this has no effect on the SN1 reaction because it doesn't depend on the nucleophile. But for an SN2 reaction, the rate does depend on a nucleophile. So if you weaken the strength of the nucleophile, then the rate of the SN2 reaction goes down. So to sum it all up, a protic solvent increases the rate of an SN1 reaction by stabilizing the transition state and by stabilizing the carbocation that forms. A protic solvent can decrease the rate of an SN2 reaction because a protic solvent like water can solvate the nucleophile, thus decreasing the rate of the SN2 reaction. But it has no effect on the SN1 reaction because the nucleophile is not included in the rate law expression. Now for a polar aprotic solvent, it enhances the strength of the nucleophile because it doesn't solvate it. And so that increases the rate of the SN2 reaction relative to what it would be in a protic environment. So hopefully this video helps you to see why SN1 reactions work better in protic environments, whereas in SN2 reactions work better in a polar aprotic environment. So that's all I got. Thanks for watching.